There once was a goal far beyond any other. It was buried in our ancient past and would last only briefly. The goal was to know everything. This was the ambition of the museum and library of Alexandria. Its rulers, scholars, and students would pursue this. I've long had a fascination of libraries. This began when I was four or five years old. Libraries hold our story and the story of all things possible. As just a boy, my visits would take me to distant mystical lands, ancient places, faraway galaxies, fictitious worlds, and inside the heads of storytellers from around the world and throughout time. They posed what-if scenarios. I would meet people in the books with ways of life strange to my young mind. Libraries were the place of sports legends, long dead or alive. It brought them to me. Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb, the two greatest baseball players, could hang out with me for a few hundred pages. Babe taught me to dream big, and Ty taught me intensity. In a library, I walked along the mountain pass of central Greece on the way to the Oracle with Oedipus 2,500 years ago. Mark Twain lured me into mischief with Tom Sawyer on the Mississippi. I traveled with Paul Gauguin to Martinique and Tahiti. This was the place history came alive. I was there, at least in thought. The greatest of stories rested there, waiting to be retold again and again and again. The library was a meditative experience for me, but it was because I let it be. I would always check out books, but each visit I would wander the aisles, drawn from book after book, learning of entire new subjects. Visits often lasted hours. I was in disbelief that so much of all that was could be in one place. If I were unaware libraries existed and I had been told of the concept, I would have replied that there is nothing greater. One day at a young age in the library, a book called out to me. I could feel the contents were special. The book was on an Egyptian city called Alexandria. Its obsession with learning and its library. The word sang out to me like no other. A distant place at a distant time, but yet containing so much of the world's knowledge. All these years later, it still holds my fascination. I begin the story of the Alexandrian Library by telling of Alexander the Great, who was born in 356 BC in Pella, Greece. He was the son of Philip, the Macedon king, whose kingdom spread throughout northern Greece. Philip had plans to invade the Persian Empire to the east, but was assassinated before he could begin. Alexander would succeed him. Alexander had the privilege of being taught by Aristotle, who had been taught by Plato, who had been taught by Socrates, the greatest teacher to student lineage in history. The four Greeks are some of history's most profound thinkers. Alexander the Great had a fascination with the author Homer. He kept a copy under his pillow at night of Homer's Iliad, the now 3,200-year-old tale of the Trojan War. One night it is said that Homer appeared to Alexander in a dream and stayed and cited two lines from his book, The Odyssey, the tale of Odysseus' epic return from the Trojan War. The lines were of Pharos on the northern shore of Egypt. Alexander immediately made the voyage to Pharos, would make this his capital, and named it after himself, Alexandria. He took this ambition to the intellectual. He was an avid reader of books. Even on his military campaigns, there was a supply chain of books, including bringing the Iliad into battle. 
He conceived of a learning center beyond what had ever been imagined. There would be a library which had the audacious goal of containing every original script or book in the world. The result was what many believe to be the height of man's intellectual efforts. Alexander's interest in Egypt no doubt came from its long-term influence on Greece. Large numbers of Greeks were allowed to settle in Egypt in the 7th century BC under Egyptian pharaoh Psamtik I, some 300 years before Alexander's birth. Greek scholars would go back and forth to study at the libraries in Egypt. The Greeks learned much from the Egyptians. This would include writing on papyrus, which the word paper comes from, the decimal system, a more correct calendar, astronomy, higher mathematics, philosophy, medicine, and on and on. This new tool of writing on the papyrus allowed Homer to first write the Iliad and the Odyssey, tales which had carried down verbally for over 500 years. Alexander would, through military might and expertise, create an empire that spanned what are now all or parts of 32 countries, an area of 2 million square miles, about seven and a half times larger than the U.S. state of Texas or eight times the size of the country of France. He was undefeated in battle. The construction of the empire was a military campaign that lasted 10 years. He died at the age of 32 in Babylon on returning from the east, never making it back to his capital or seeing the construction of it. Alexander's wife was pregnant during his death. This son would, upon reaching his 14th year, would be king of the empire for a short time until he was murdered. The Diadochi were those who fought for control over parts of Alexander's empire. The word Diadochi is derived from the Greek word meaning successors. This was mostly among his generals, who would rule various sections of it. There would be many wars among the Diadochi. The division of Alex's, Alexander's empire is more complicated than what I am about to talk about, but this will cover most of it. The European part was controlled by two Diadochi dynasties, eventually defeated by the Roman Empire in 168 BC, lasting 135 years. The Seleucid Empire, at its height, controlled most of the land moving east from Europe to the border of China and into western India. From north to south, this was as great as 1,300 miles. It existed 312 BC to 63 BC, 249 years, and was founded by Seleucus I, Alexander's general. Antioch was founded by Seleucus, going on to become one of antiquity's great cities, and it was thought the words Christianity and Christian were first used here. Wars with the Parthians from Iran, the Armenians, and Romans led to their defeat. Three Hellenistic empires would become independent from the Seleucid Empire. These are Pergamon, Greco-Bactrian, and Greco-Himalayan. The Kingdom of Pergamon existed in what now is Western Turkey. It remained under control of the Macedonian European kingdoms until 281, and remained a kingdom until 133 BC. They fought with the Romans against the Seleucid Empire, and Rome expanded the territory of Pergamon to include what is now most of Western Turkey. These were former Seleucid lands. It became one of the world's great learning and art centers, though not quite comparable to Alexandria. It existed under and as a separate kingdom from 281 to 133 BC. The last king of Pergamon, Attalus III, gave Pergamon to... The Greco-Bactrian Empire would secede 
from the Seleucid Empire around the year 250 BC and would last until around the year 100 BC. The Bactrian Empire had its capitals in what are now in northern Afghanistan. The empire reached the western edges of China and northwestern corner of India on its eastern border. To the west, it included what today is northern Iran. Its area of control also included most of the current countries of Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. This area is about six times the size of California. The Indo-Greco Empire was in northwestern India. It was founded in 200 BC as Demetrius invaded from Bactria. It would last until about 10 AD. The last of these was Alexander's capital. Ptolemy I Sauter took control of it and all of Egypt in 305 BC. His descendants would rule through Cleopatra 275 years later. Ptolemy may have been Alexander's half-brother as he was born to one of Alexander's father's concubines. Ptolemy would carry forward Alexander's vision of creating the learning center of the world. The next episode will be on the Golden Age of Alexandria. Please subscribe and like, and thank you so much for watching.